Hi, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Dr. Justy has quite a packed presentation for us, and we do want to leave time for questions. We are so very pleased that you could be here to join us today and uh, for our guest speaker. Our session today will leave some time for questions, as I mentioned, and to do that, please use the Q&A feature to add your questions. After the presentation, we will have Dr. Justy get to as many as we can. I, I do want to make a distinction. There is a chat box. That's not the one we're talking about. We want you to use the Q&A session or Q&A box. So to get going, let me introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Dilip Justy. And as you can see here on this slide, he wears many hats. He's a very busy man. Uh, his Education was split between India and the United States. In Pune, India, he completed his medical education and obtained his psychiatry training in Mumbai. While in the United States, he completed a psychiatry residency at Cornell and a neurology residency at George Washington University. Uh, he was a research fellow and later chief of the units on the movement disorders and dementias at the National Institutes of Mental Health. Uh, and this was before joining us here at UC San Diego. In coming to UC San Diego, Dr. Justy started the geriatric psychiatry program from scratch, from the bottom up, and it is now one of the largest ones in the world. He has held important positions with key national and inter international organizations and has been or has uh, gained many awards and honors, not the least of which is an honorary fellowship with the UK's Royal College of psychiatrist. Dr. Justy's main areas of research, as you can imagine, include schizophrenia, neuropsychiatric interventions, and successful aging. And he's been a PI on a number of research and training grants. And from all of this, you might imagine that Dr. Justy has been very busy writing. He's a prolific author with over 725 articles, and over 160 book chapters, and 14 published books. And this includes the most recent one, Wiser, which is the topic of our talk today. As a previous TED Med speaker, I think we are in for a very interesting discussion of the neurobiology of wisdom, as well as its relationship with aging. Dr. Justy, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Karen, for uh, such a kind introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure and an honor to talk uh, for the UCSD library. So I'm going to talk on science of wisdom in the era of the new pandemics. First of all, I want to thank all my colleagues, faculty, trainees, as well as staff at the Stein Institute for Research on Aging, as well as Geriatric Psychiatry Division at UCSD. Uh, and I specifically want to mention some colleagues, um, Dr. Ellen Lee, Dr. Michael Thomas, Dr. Barton Palmer, Dr. Colin Depp, and Dr. Tanya Wynn. So it is really a work done by whole team that I'll be talking about. I'm going to begin with what is wisdom? How do we define it? How can we measure it? And what is the neurobiology of wisdom? What is the relationship to brain? Then I will discuss wisdom and aging. After that comes the issue about the modern behavioral pandemics of, such as those of loneliness, suicides, opioid use, and how is wisdom related to them? And finally, can we become wiser? How can we enhance wisdom and how? So the first part is defining wisdom. As we all know, wisdom is an ancient construct. It is there in practically all the religions and philosophies. Sophia is considered the Greek goddess of wisdom. The word philosophy literally means love of wisdom. And for centuries, wisdom has been a province of priests and philosophers. It is only recently 
that empirical research on wisdom started. The empirical research started in the 1970s at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, with Paul Bartis, and at University of Southern California, USC, at, um, in Los Angeles with Vivian Clayton. In the beginning, there were very few publications. But the good news is that the research is growing by leaps and bounds. In the last 10 years, there have been 2,000 papers that you can see on PubMed that had wisdom in the title or as one of the keywords. However, most of this research has been done by gerontologists, sociologists, psychologists, medicine or healthcare researchers and neuroscientists have not been involved in the wisdom researcher to any significant extent until recently. So when I first broached the idea about studying wisdom, this was about 15 years ago, and we had a meeting of our internal external advisors, and I said that at the Stein Institute for Research on Aging, we should study successful aging, including things that are supposed to increase with aging, like wisdom. And several of the colleagues there, their jaws literally dropped, and they said, you can't study wisdom. Wisdom is a province of philosophers and priests, not of scientists. And I took that as a challenge because people had said the same thing about consciousness, stress, resilience. They said, these are all fuzzy constructs you can't define and they're not for science. I don't agree with that. And we know that in terms of those constructs where we know their biology so well, consciousness, stress, and resilience. But the first thing when you start doing research on anything is define it. And how do you define it? By looking at the literature. And the literature on wisdom, of course, started in the ancient times with the scriptures. In the Bible, there are 12 books of wisdom, including the book of Job. In India, there is a scripture called the Gita, which includes really a thesis of wisdom in practical life. So we conducted a mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative study of wisdom in that document using a medical anthropologist as a consultant to find out what were the components of wisdom. Next, we looked at the empirical literature on wisdom. As I said, this is the literature since the mid 1970s. So we looked at different papers that had tried to define wisdom and see what their definitions included. And finally, we put together a panel of international experts who had published anything on wisdom. And we used a method called Delphi method or RAND panel method to seek consensus. So when we did all these things, my expectation was that we will come up with very different definitions because wisdom is predominantly a cultural concept. It would vary from time to time, one culture to another. We were surprised, we were shocked to see that the basic concepts of wisdom were very similar across these different methods. There were differences, no question. There were some minor differences here and there, but the basic construct did not seem to have changed. And what is the basic construct? The basic construct is that wisdom is a personality trait. It's a trait like say extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, optimism, resilience. So personality trait, by that we refer to characteristic patterns of behavior, thoughts, and feeling that an individual has. But wisdom is different from other traits in that it has multiple components. And what are those components? So I'm going to describe mention here the various components that we found were common across the different definitions. The first and the most important is pro-social behaviors. Empathy and compassion, things that we do for other people rather than selfishly for ourselves. Then comes emotional regulation, control over our emotions. Think about a teenager whose emotions fluctuate from hour to hour, minute to minute, and then think about a wiser, 
older person who is pretty well controlled emotionally. Self-reflection, ability to look inwards, try to understand our own behavior. Then comes a balance between decisiveness and accepting uncertainty and diversity. So on the one hand, you have to accept uncertainties of life as well as diversity of perspectives. I may have strong values, but I can understand why somebody else may have different values. That doesn't mean one of us is evil or dumb. At the same time, I cannot be sitting on the fence all the time. I need to be decisive when needed. And finally, and this is probably the most controversial component of wisdom, if not accepted by all, is spirituality, which is different from religiosity. Spirituality means connectedness, connectedness with something or someone that's always there, whether we call that entity, consciousness, soul, or God, uh, or nature. The next question was then, how do you measure it? As I said, wisdom is a personality trait, and there are scales for measuring different personality traits. Typically, the scales include a bunch of statements about your behavior, thoughts, and feeling, and you say whether you agree or disagree with those statements. So with my colleague, Michael Thomas, uh, who's an expert in scale development, we developed the San Diego Wisdom Scale, or STYs. This has 28 items. And each is to be rated on a one to five scale, strongly disagree to strongly agree. We have shown that this has good to excellent psychometric properties. It has already been translated into several languages. And a couple of examples of the items. One is, it is important that I understand the reasons for my action. So here we are looking at self-reflection. Another is I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. That means when the emotions take over, I stop thinking clearly. So that means lack of emotional regulation. So some items are positively worded, some are negatively worded. People often confuse wisdom and intelligence. Obviously, you need some basic intelligence to be wise. You have to have some brain integrity in order to have wisdom. However, there is no one-to-one -one correlation between wisdom and intelligence. Actually, not at all. In the sense, some people who score very high on IQ, they are not the wisest people. Uh, number of them do not have empathy and compassion. Antisocial people, including uh, mass murderers or terrorists, they can be very intelligent, but nobody will say that they are wise, obviously. Same thing about social intelligence, emotional intelligence. Wisdom includes some components of them, but it is much more than that. One question that often comes up in science is, uh, you know, when I talk about these different components of wisdom, people say, that's fine, these are different components, but how do you know that they represent a single entity, a single latent factor of wisdom? So with that in mind, we did a study recently of 1,700 plus people looking at our 28 items San Diego wisdom scale, and we looked at each of the components and how it was related to the overall wisdom construct. We use confirmatory factor analysis. And we found that each of these components was significantly related to wisdom. However, the level of correlation varied considerably. Empathy and compassion had the strongest correlation, pro-social behavior, 0.91, whereas spirituality had the lowest correlation 0.32. So clearly there are variations in terms of relationship of this factor to wisdom. So one thing I mentioned again was that the basic construct of wisdom hasn't changed since ancient times. What does it mean? It means that wisdom is primarily biologically based. Again, obviously it is affected by cultural and societal factors, no question, but it is primarily biologically based and that's why the basic construct hasn't changed. Obviously it is based in the brain, but where in the brain? How do we even begin to decide where in the brain wisdom is located? So we reviewed the literature on neurobiology of individual components of wisdom. 
Actually, when we started, we did a Google search using wisdom on one hand and neurobiology on the other hand. We did not find any paper because the neuroscientists had never used the word wisdom. So we then looked at neurobiology of individual components of wisdom. For example, there's quite a bit of literature on neurobiology of empathy, of empathy or compassion, as well as their antithesis. For example, neurobiology of antisocial personality. And using that, we found some areas of the brain that were common to different components. But then the question was, we are talking about neurobiology of components of wisdom. How do we know that it pertains to wisdom as a whole? What we did was we looked at what I call experiments of nature. People who were wise to start with, then something happened to their brain, either brain injury or a brain disease, and they became unwise. Where was the brain injury or the brain damage? That was a question. Of course, when we review the literature, if you use the word wisdom, you're not going to find anything because most people didn't use that word. So what we had to do was look at people with histories of brain injury and diseases with changes in personality or behavior patterns. And we found a number of cases of that kind with brain injury. The best known among them is Phineas Gage. I think many of you know about Phineas Gage. He was a construction worker in Vermont in the mid 19th century. Young man who was thought to be smart, nice, helpful. One day there's a big explosion and the large iron rod went through his brain. It damaged it. And the only result though was that his personality changed. If you look at his description that was given by his personal physician, he went from being a kind, nice, helpful man to essentially antisocial person. And his other components also changed. Where was the damage? His skull was preserved. And scientists looked at the specific area of the damage under the paper that was published in Science in 1990, which showed that the damage was mainly restricted to the prefrontal cortex. Similarly, there's a disease called frontotemporal dementia, where the damage is, of course, to the frontal and anterior temporal lobes. And again, the symptoms of this disease are exact antithesis of wisdom. So based on all this, we propose the brain regions that were involved in wisdom. These brain regions, primarily two, two areas of the brain. One is prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is the newest part of the brain in evolution. And the other is limbic striatum. That's the oldest part of the brain in evolution, okay? So the prefrontal cortex, again, it is not all of the prefrontal cortex, but specific areas such as dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate, also insula separately. And then in terms of striatum, there's ventral striatum, especially amygdala. So these were the regions that were represented in individual components of wisdom and that were also involved in these case studies that I described with brain injuries or diseases like frontotemporal dementia. Wisdom and aging. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist and I often wondered about why do humans live so long? And this is a question that actually has some evolutionary value. Because if you think about Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest, what does that hypothesis state? <coughs> it, it is based on the fact that most vertebrates die soon after they lose fertility. <coughs> um, so that happens for lions, tigers, all of these animals who live in the wild, they die when they lose fertility. We humans, the women have menopause around the age of 45, 50. Men have andropause, similar age, 45, 50. So 
Today, the average lifespan in the US is 80 years, okay? It will soon be 90. So if somebody lives to age 90, they have spent half of their lifespan without fertility. That means for those 40 plus years, they're not contributing to species survival. They're not creating children. So why should they live? The question then is, is there some aging associated change that contributes to the species related fitness without producing children? Okay, so that's the question. And does anything really get better with aging? Several years ago, we started a study called SAGE, Successful Aging Evaluation at the Stein Institute. We included 1500 plus people from the San Diego community from age 20 to 100 plus. Okay, and we have been following these people now for over 10 years. We looked at physical health and mental well being. So this is the physical health. So what do we see that in the 20s and 30s, the physical health is at its best. That is as we would expect, that's a fountain of youth, right? But then it starts declining. So by the time people are in their 90s, most people are disabled. What about mental well-being? It goes exactly in the opposite direction. 20s and 30s, the fountain of youth, is also the fountain of stress, depression, anxiety. The rates of suicide have been increasing in the last few decades in the teenagers and in people in their 20s and early 30s. This is a highly stressful period. The good news is that things start getting better after that. Not that the stress goes down, but people face or cope with the stress much better. And so subjective well-being improves with aging. And that's not the only thing that improves with aging. Number of studies by different researchers have shown that older adults do better than younger ones on emotional regulation, positivity, that is favoring positive emotions and memory and forgetting about the negative or stressful ones, Empathy and compassion, pro-social behaviors, self-reflection. And aging comes with experience and that's why the experience-based decision-making improves. So if you look at this, these are exactly the components of wisdom that I talked about, right? Emotional regulation, empathy, compassion, self-reflection, de decision-making. So there is suggestion that these are things that actually get better with aging. But going beyond that, there is something called grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. I'm sorry, you may not be able to see the title, uh, but the title says grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. What does the grandmother hypothesis state? It states that when the grandmother helps her adult daughter raise children, this adult daughter lives longer she is happier and produces more children than her mother did. She produces more children because she has more time because the grandma is taking care of the other kid. And this is actually hardcore science. These are papers published in Nature and Science. These are studies done not only in humans, but also in a couple other species, such as uh, uh, killer whales and uh, bottlenose dolphins. So the idea is that older people, although they can't reproduce, they can help species survival by helping the younger generation live longer, be happier, and be more fertile. Actually, here at UCSD, Ajit Varki and colleagues um, described what are called grandparent genes. Uh, they found that variants of CD33 and APOE, which are associated with better functioning heart and brain, were associated with aging, so that means those people who have this variant, they will live longer and they'll be capable of transmitting their wisdom to the younger generations. And the usefulness of grandparents for younger generation has been shown in numerous studies. This one study was done in UK, a large study of 1500 plus 
secondary school students aged 11 to 16. They found that when grandparents were involved in raising the kids, as these kids grew up, they had fewer emotional problems, they had more pro-social behaviors like empathy and compassion, they had fewer adjustment difficulties. And this was especially true in teenagers coming from lone parent or step-parent families, which are actually at the highest risk of the kids suffering from childhood neglect or abuse. And then there is one study which I always like to quote. It's an amazing example of how intergenerational activities are so helpful for both the generations. This is a study that is called Experience Core. It was done at Johns Hopkins. It was funded by MacArthur Foundation for a number of years. What they did in this study was they invited some older adults in the community who had retired from their jobs. Okay, these were people over 65 who were retired. And they divided them into two groups. One group was then trained to serve and help kids in public elementary school. And they had to agree to spend at least 15 hours a week for one full year. Okay, 15 hours a week for one full year, public elementary school. And the other group, of course, didn't have to do that. <coughs> they followed these kids and the older adults over a period of a year. Of course, the kids, their grades went through the roof. They were very happy. I can imagine these kids didn't have grandparents and sometimes not even functioning parents. So they had no grandparent substitutes who helped them. But look at what happened to older people those who participated. Their mental health improved, physical health improved, including biomarkers of stress and aging in blood and urine, and the volume of the hippocampus on brain MRI was larger at the end of the study in people, <coughs> in older people who had worked in these elementary schools compared to those who had not. Now, this doesn't mean that the volume of hippocampus increased. It did not increase. But what it means is it did not decline in these people compared to the control group. So what it means is that actually the intergenerational activities are that you just don't make you feel good, but they have biological effects on health. Uh, how is that possible? How can anything get better in brain with aging? When I went to medical school, I was taught that the only thing that happened to brain with aging is that it shrinks, it loses neurons, synapses, everything. Well, uh, research in the last three decades or so, uh, including that done by a number of UCSD colleagues and uh, spe especially want to mention um, uh, Rusty Gage, uh, uh, but also a number of uh, UCSD researchers, they have shown that there is greater recruitment and more efficient utilization of neuronal networks in people who are active older people who stay active physically, cognitively, socially, there's improvement in their functioning. There is formation of new synapses and even new neurons, but the neuronal generation is only restricted to non-cortical brain regions. And this has been shown not just in humans, this has been shown in a bunch of animal species. So what, how do we explain emotional regulation and positivity? Number of brain imaging studies have shown that with aging, the amygdala becomes less active in response to negative stimuli, regret, or fear. The activation of amygdala with positive images remains same, but the negative images, it goes down. So, so there are reasons why you can, we can believe that there are changes occurring in brain of people who are active in older age that may help improve their wisdom. Of course, there's a caveat that after a certain age, and that will vary from person to person, when the dementia sets in, obviously the neuroplasticity is not going to be there anymore. Then I want to move to the area of the modern pandemics. You know, of course, when we talk about pandemic today, everybody thinks about COVID-19 and of course, so it's killed half a million Americans um, 
and so many all over the world. What people don't know is that something like that, the loneliness part of that has been going on for the last two decades. And research in the last three decades actually has shown that there is something called psychosocial determinant of health. Social relationship, social support, social engagement. What you see on this graph is um, are the effect sizes or odds ratios of different factors as related to mortality. And the top three are social relationships in one form or another. After that, all the bottom ones are the traditional risk factors like smoking, drinking, physical activity, sedentary behavior, BMI, things like that. And what you see is that the social factors, the effect sizes on mortality of social factors are equal to or greater than those of factors like smoking, drinking, physical inactivity, and so on. Loneliness, especially, has been called a grand challenge for the society, also called a silent killer. It increases the odds of mortality by 30%. It is as dangerous to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, a day and more dangerous than mild to moderate obesity. In the US, 162,000 Americans die per year due to loneliness. And this has been occurring years before COVID set in. And this number is greater than the number secondary to lung cancer or stroke. In the UK, a new minister of loneliness was appointed in 2018 because of the concern that the country was losing billions of pounds because of loneliness of the worker. And why does loneliness kill so many people because loneliness underlies suicides. And the rates of suicide in the US have gone up by 33% in the last two decades. And you know, this increase has been greater in younger people than in the older people. Opioid use. Opioid use related deaths have increased six folds in the last 20 years. And again, Loneliness is something that strongly predisposes to opioid abuse. Again, that's not the only reason, but definitely it's an important predisposing factor. And because of that, the average lifespan in the US dropped before COVID came in. Average lifespan in the US dropped in 2015, 16, 17. So it had nothing to do with COVID. It was mainly loneliness, social isolation that were contributing to suicides, opioid use, as well as various other physical illnesses. So why is loneliness so bad? Uh, there's a large study of, large JIVA study of loneliness in the US, uh, in the UK, uh, with nearly half a million people. They found that based on twin studies and family-based studies, that loneliness is modestly heritable trait, about 50%, with a highly polygenic architecture. And the problem is that the genes that predispose to loneliness also predispose to cardiovascular diseases, metabolic diseases, and psychiatric disorders like major depression and dementia. The good news, and this is really the good news uh, that we are excited about. Uh, our research in the last mm, couple of years has consistently shown that there's a strong inverse correlation between wisdom and loneliness. This is a paper that uh, Tanya Wen was the first author we published uh, last year. Um, so what you see is um, a score on our San Diego wisdom scale on the x-axis and score on the loneliness scale on the y-axis. The correlation is negative 0.51. And in behavioral research, that's a pretty meaningful correlation. And it is, there's a lot of other evidence to support this inverse relationship. Many, many studies have shown that loneliness is associated with worse physical health and worse mental health. Similarly, numerous studies have shown that wisdom and compassion are associated with better physical health and better mental health. We published four studies in the last two years that showed 
a strong inverse correlation between loneliness and wisdom compassion. Just like the slide I showed you earlier, the study I've been studied, uh, Ellen Lee had published a study earlier and a couple of studies we have published since then. Total sample size of several thousand people. And this is even more exciting. We have a paper that is under review. Uh, Ellen Lee's uh, first author, it's, this is a longitudinal study in which we found that level of compassion at baseline, as well as increase in compassion over the next seven years, predicted loneliness at the end. And I'm excited to say that we are developing and testing a new intervention for compassion training in order to reduce loneliness. And I'm very happy to say that this work is being funded, the pilot study by UCSD's Sanford Institute. And what I want to show you is actually the biological support for this opposite relationship between wisdom and compassion. We have a paper that was just accepted. This is a paper from Jyoti Mishra's uh, group, EEG. Uh, her neural engineering and translational labs. So we studied 147 adults ages 18 to 85. So one region that is important in both loneliness and wisdom is temporoparietal junction. And what Jyoti found in the study was that loneliness was associated with greater activity in the presence of angry emotions, whereas wisdom was associated with greater activity in the presence of happy emotions. Similarly, we found that there's a differential involvement of ventral striatum in loneliness versus insula in wisdom. So ventral striatum was involved more in loneliness, insula more in wisdom. So there is some sort of emerging biological evidence to support this opposite relationship. And this is um, perhaps equally, if not more interesting, is a study of gut microbiome. Uh, this was, of course, done in collaboration with uh, Rob Knight's uh, Center for Microbiome Innovation and Tanya Wen, the first author. This paper was accepted actually less than a month ago. Uh, used in 16 RNA, 184 adults ages 28 to 97. Alpha and beta diversity. So alpha diversity is diversity within a sample. Beta refers to diversity between the sample. And diversity is good for microbiome also uh, because it shows phylogenetic richness. And what the study showed was that greater diversity was associated with compassion, wisdom, and social engagement, whereas lower diversity was associated with loneliness. So finally, can we enhance wisdom? Because what I showed you was if wisdom and loneliness go in the opposite direction, can we actually reduce loneliness by increasing wisdom? But the question is, can we increase wisdom at all? And why do we think it can be increased? Because just like loneliness, most traits are about 50% inherited. That means 50% they're affected by environment and behavior. And we know that wisdom may increase with aging, experience, and learning. But we also know that it is reduced by specific brain trauma or disease. That means wisdom is modifiable. And what are the possible ways of enhancing wisdom? Today, the ways are only psychosocial behavioral. But I think in future, pharmacological, biological, and technological means will become available and feasible. So is there any evidence that components of wisdom can be increased? And actually the answer is absolutely yes. This was a study again, uh, headed by Ellen Lee that was published in JAMA Psychiatry um, last year. This was a meta-analysis of 57 randomized control trials that sought to increase one of the components of wisdom. So some of them focused on empathy and compassion, some focused on emotional regulation, and some focused on spirituality. These were studies done in people with mental illnesses, people with physical illnesses, or people from the general population. But overall, nearly half of the studies reported significant enhancement of the component of wisdom that they were studying with moderate to large effect sizes. Okay, these were reasonably well done studies. Uh, so what, what, what this means is that with certain psychosocial behavioral intervention, 
it is possible to increase certain components of wisdom. And when we use these interventions, so some of them include mindfulness and meditation, and there is now em strong emerging evidence that things like mindfulness and meditation don't have only psychological effects, they have biological effects. They may increase, um, they may reduce the expression of pro-inflammatory genes, or they may increase the activity of telomerase as well as increase white matter integrity um, with meditation. So this is all for research purposes. Well, what can we do in real life? What can we do in everyday life to become wiser? So that means actually the decision-making. We make thousands of decisions every day and the minor decisions don't matter. But the major decisions, if we make it a habit of making decisions which, are, which involve self-reflection, emotional regulation with positivity, empathy, compassion, decisiveness, amid uncertainty and spirituality that lead to wiser behavior. So the first step in the process of becoming wiser is on a self-reflection. As I mentioned, we published a scale called San Diego Wisdom Scale or SD Wise. I would uh, suggest that um, everybody who is interested in that, please take that scale. Just take a few minutes uh, and then you'll get a score for each of the components of wisdom at the total, total score. So that'll tell you which components you're strong in and which uh, you are not strong in. I mean, all of us have limitations and strengths. You know, again, obviously no scale is perfect and the scale doesn't prove anything, but at least it's a step in the right direction. How do we enhance compassion? So one way of enhancing compassion is role playing. For example, if you put on blindfolds for 24 hours, we can empathize with a person who is blind. Similarly, if we spend 24, 48 hours in a wheelchair, will understand and not get frustrated with people in a wheelchair because they're moving so slowly, right? Keeping a gratitude diary. Write a couple of things before you go to bed in a diary that made you feel grateful. Random acts of kindness. Again, think about that and try to practice them every day. Then it becomes second nature. When we talk about compassion, people often don't think about self-compassion. Actually, I have found people, including physicians, uh, others, other clinicians, uh, priests, they're very compassionate, but they are very harsh on themselves. Uh, that doesn't help. Uh, so how do you increase self-compassion? One is self-kindness. Offer yourself soothing comfort that you would to your friend. Sense of common humanity. If you make a mistake, realize that everybody makes mistakes and everybody faces ser serious challenges in life. And mindfulness, which means that when you feel upset, sure, remember that you felt upset in the past and you got over it and you survived. So when I talk about self-compassion, again, I'm not talking about excessive self-compassion because that becomes narcissism, right? So you have to have the right balance. Uh, so I'm coming to the end of my talk, uh, but I really think this is an area of exciting research, especially for uh, empirical sciences. Um, I think the future research will need to include longitudinal studies, including genomics, neurocircuitry with functional imaging, um, <coughs> animal studies, because that's one of the questions, whether the animals can be wise. Clearly some components are present in um, the pets or some of the larger animals that we see. Empathy, compassion, you can see that in animals. Um, but which components can be there and which cannot be? That's something we have to see. Biological means of enhancing wisdom. You know, we talked about brain regions, when they're damaged, the wisdom goes down. So if you stimulate them, will wisdom increase? So that's where there's reputed to transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, in psychiatry, our new chair, Dr. Jeff Daskalakas, he is a world expert in that area. And that's something we hope to study in the future. And finally, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, actually, we work with IBM on a center for AI for healthy living. And we're looking at AI, I and mean, I feel that today's AI is very smart. It can do in seconds what 
humans would need years to compute. But it needs to go beyond that. IQ is not everything. Actually, it needs to include empathy, compassion, and other things that we talked about. The machines are not going to have consciousness. However, we can train them so that they can help their human users to be more compassionate. And these are my last two slides, last, just a couple of slides. Okay. So I've been talking about individual wisdom, but what about societal wisdom? Are societies wise versus less wise? I think so. I mean, if you think about what is happening today, as I said, the rates of suicide have gone up by 33%. Rates of opioid-related deaths have increased sixfold. Loneliness has increased twice. The average lifespan is falling. There is something happening in the recent decades. We are living in a highly stressed society, highly polarized, politically and even otherwise. People are angry, anxious, stressed out, depressed. And so these are actually the modern behavioral pandemics of loneliness, suicide, and opioid-related deaths of despair. So the pandemics don't only apply to infectious agents and COVID and flu. Uh, so what we need is we need to counter this behavioral pandemic with some behavioral vaccine. And given this emerging strong evidence about opposite relationship between wisdom and loneliness, one might suggest that the soft skills of wisdom, like compassion, self-reflection, should be taught to students, businesses, and God forbid, maybe one of our politicians. And the good news is that actually there are things happening now at the societal level globally. There is something called age-friendly cities and communities network. There's compassionate communities network movement started in UK and now it is spreading to other parts of the world. And this is my last slide. So I think if we, focus on educating people on the components of wisdom, rewarding people who show those uh, abilities, we can slowly but surely transform today's lonely, distressed, and polarized world into happier, healthier, and wiser society. Let me stop here. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Well, Let thank me... you so very much. We did get a few questions, and so uh, one of them follows on your last couple of slides. Mm -hmm. Do you have a website with information on these topics? And so um, we had the aging.ucsd.edu one. Um, are there any others that uh, you might suggest? Yeah, so as you mentioned, we recently published that book, Wiser, um, and we have to publish a bunch of papers uh, over the years. And so if you also feel free to email me, uh, djstay at ucsd, health.ucsd.edu, and uh, I'll be happy to send you those papers. Great. All right, so an early one that came in is, how is spirituality defined? Is it compassion also, or sorry, is compassion also a trait associated with wisdom? Yes. Yeah. So empathy and compassion are the strongest components of wisdom. We call them pro-social behaviors. And they're clearly a critical part. I think you cannot be wise if you're not empathic and compassionate. At that, we saw was the strongest correlation. The weakest component, though, was spirituality, uh, because it is not accepted by everyone. And spirituality is defined differently by different people. Some people mix spirituality and religiosity. They are different though. Religiosity requires focus on an organized religions with certain fixed principles, fixed books, uh, cards or whatever. Spirituality is not related to any specific religion. So an atheist can be spiritual. As I said, it is defined differently by different people. We define spirituality as constant connectedness with something or someone, whether we call that nature, consciousness, soul, or God, doesn't matter. But it's that constant feeling of constant connectedness that I see as spirituality. 
Thank you. All right, so we had another question that said, fascinating findings and study results, thanks. In the world of big data, algorithms and scoring of people, any suggestions on how wisdom findings may influence effective business decisions and policies? I think that's a very good question. And uh, actually, some of the business people actually approached, I mean, I gave a TED talk a few years ago, and uh, there has been interest in the businesses. And actually, another way of thinking about this in the UK, there is a new minister of loneliness. And the reason there is a new minister was because of pressure from businesses. The businesses told the government that they were losing millions of pounds because of the loneliness of the workers. And I really think the way to handle that loneliness is not just by joining social media, but reducing loneliness through empathy, compassion, self-reflection, and other components of wisdom. And there is no movement such as this compassionate communities movement, which is really exciting. I believe that you know, at UCSD, and I'm really proud of the fact that at UCSD, we are beginning this compassion training for students. Uh, and uh, again, the Sanford Institute uh, that uh, Dr. Bill Mowgli uh, heads, uh, again, th that's, that's the kind of work that is needed in order to expand these findings to the societal level. So I agree with you that this is something that needs to happen in starting with schools from uh, kindergarten to graduate school, to medical school, engineering school, and then businesses and government. Great. All right. Um... Well, we had a compliment from uh, Lily, who said, I am very interested in working in this field now. Thank you so much, Dr. Justy. How can I get more involved in this field? Also, how can I participate in doing the research and applying more compassion to the community? Thank you for that question. I think uh, I would say, uh, please write to me. <laughs> We can, uh, because and it's, it's, it's great that we have uh, people who are interested and then we will, there are different ways in which different people can uh, get uh, involved. There's no single way, obviously it depends on the context, situation, feasibility and so on. Uh, one thing we're excited right now also is uh, uh, testing the new intervention for compassion training. Uh, and in future, we'll be looking at therapies who come from the community, not um, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, or other uh, professionals, but people from the community, we train them to train other people in the community on compassion. So we would love to have actually people uh, outside the field get into this. Great. And we had a, another question that said, how long has this wisdom study gone on and where can I get my book signed. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the book is, again, I'm not promoting the book here, you know, but the book is available on Amazon. Uh, and uh, if you Google, you will get information. Uh, also, there's a website called wiserthebook.com, uh, etc. Um, and I'll be happy to sign it. I'm right here. <laughs> at <UCC. laughs> Great. Sorry. All right. So how is the how is wisdom related to or a part of interpersonal neurobiological theories or practice? Okay, great question. That's a really a great question. And I think because what we are finding in terms of loneliness being opposite of wisdom in several ways. And loneliness and social isolation, they really depend on the interpersonal relationship that the quality of the relationship is poor when people are lonely or they feel socially isolated. And that needs to improve. And if you have empathy, compassion, uh, emotional regulation, self-reflection, that will increase. So one of the goals actually of wisdom-based therapies would be to improve and enhance the quality of interpersonal relationship. So that's a very wise question. Great. 
Uh, let's see. So we asked, uh, someone asked for um, Dr. Justy's email, which I see we've done. Um, and there were questions about the aging uh, uh, URL that you used. And I am just going to finish that up because I think you um, just used aging.ucsd.edu, but I think that uh, uh, takes them to the Stein Healthy Aging website. Is that correct? Yes, but within that, then if you search for uh, the word wisdom or wiser or whatever, you, you, you'll get that. And again, if you run into any problem, please uh, email me. Great. Uh, so uh, the next question is, if we practice, I I'm going to make a mistake on pronouncing this, but Bhakti, B-H-A-K-T-I yoga, with daily meditations and spirituality, will this also aid in telomere production? That, that's a very good question. I think probably one will need to do a study to uh, see if that happens. Uh, but I do believe that these techniques, uh, such as meditation, mindfulness, you know, I mean, until a couple of decades ago, they were dismissed as just pseudoscience. There is no evidence for that. And now that's not the case. I mean, there is there are so many papers that are now published and even NIH is funding studies on meditation and mindfulness because there's growing evidence of uh, changes in the brain that you see in brain imaging, uh, changes in the biomarkers of uh, stress, aging uh, in blood and other tissues. So these actually, I mean, I used to think of them as psychological therapies versus um, medications, which are biological. Increasingly, I believe that that's not the case, that these psychological interventions are as biological as the medications and some of the other biological interventions. Right. All right. Uh, so here's one uh, that's kind of timely with uh, talk of introverts and extroverts. Do you think that extroverts are more likely to be lonely than introverts, or is it the same for both? And a great question. Actually, this is an issue on which um, we have been having some debate within our own group. Uh, and usually one would tend to think that introverts may be more lonely. On the other hand, that actually may not be the case. Loneliness is subjective. I think I want to stress that. Loneliness is subjective. Social isolation is objective. For example, if I have, say, five friends and you have two friends, I am less isolated than you are, but I may still be more lonely because I need 50 friends and I have only five, whereas you may have two and you are happy with having two. It's the quality of the relationship that's important. So people who are lonely, that means they have subjective issues and they may be extrovert because so they may have, you know, uh, on the outside, it may look like they have 50 friends, but inside they feel lonely. On the other hand, introvert who has only two close relationships may not feel lonely. So it really, they are not, there is no direct relationship. So you can have both introverts and extroverts who feel lonely. Great. We are running out of time, but uh, I've been informed that we can extend it by a few minutes if you're willing to stay with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, great. So we had one question that said, I taught my children social consciousness. Does that apply? I think that is a wonderful thing to do. It is really critical and I'm so glad because I really think it is important for parents and teachers to teach these values. And by social consciousness, you know, what we're talking about is don't think about yourself only, think about others. And so that is empathy, just thinking about and sharing their emotion. Compassion goes beyond that where you go and help others. You know, it is like uh, when you have the first child and the, the second one is born, you teach the first one to share his or her toys with the second one and then share the toys with other kids in the class or the neighborhood. And that is social consciousness, that realizing that you are a part of a larger group and it is your duty and obligation to help them because then they will help you. 
And you, as humans, we are a social species. Actually, the word homo sapiens literally means wise man. Okay. I mean, I wish they didn't use the word man. As they should have said wise person. <laughs> but, um, and wisdom does imply, strongly imply the social consciousness and sense of social belonging, sense of giving something back to the society. So I would say that that's a really uh, important thing to do. Great. The next one is, given how you define spirituality, constant connectedness with someone or something, do you find that this construct of wisdom is most strongly related to loneliness? As I said, it is actually loneliness by definition is not being alone. It is feeling distressed by feeling that you don't have enough social relationship. So loneliness and being alone are different things, okay? Being alone is fine. Again, it, it depends on the person. I mean, it's good to be alone from time to time. You know, you need to have some time for yourself. So you can do what you want to do. You can just read, do nothing, uh, or enjoy something. That's not loneliness, though. Loneliness means not only you are alone, actually, you don't even have to be alone. You can live in a dorm, for example, college students. They live in a dorm. They're surrounded by hundreds of students. They are on Facebook and Twitter, and they have thousands of friends yet they feel very lonely. So it is important to separate out being alone and loneliness, but your point is well taken in the sense, being alone is often helpful for self-reflection because when you're alone, we can think about, you know, what stressed me out yesterday and the day before and the day before, and we find there is a common pattern that emerges. And then we can think about how we can improve so that we don't get stressed out. How can we get better? So self-reflection and then self-correction require ability to time, time with yourself so you can do an objective evaluation. Great. We have an undergrad with a question for you. Where can we sign up for compassion trainings and the fMRI studies as an undergrad? Uh, um, I don't know about this directly. I, I would suggest that please, um, um, write to Dr. Bill Mobley, Dr. William Mobley, who is um, director of the, or one of the directors, at least of the Institute, which is Sanford Institute for Compassion, and that is focusing on compassion training. Uh, and um, he can tell you more about it than I can. The study we are doing about compassion training is actually a research study. Uh, we are beginning, and this is, right now we are focusing on older people, including caregivers of people with dementia. Uh, but we hope that as we show that it works, then we can expand that to other groups. And regarding the MRI study, there is no formal study going on that I know of, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think the Compassion Institute would be a, uh, the Sanford Institute would be a great resource. Great. You mentioned the positive health impacts of intergenerational social connectedness. Do these relationships also enhance development of wisdom in the younger cohort? Absolutely. Actually, I really think that's the reason for... So when I talk about this grandmother hypothesis of wisdom and why the society needs older people, older people can transmit wisdom to the younger generation. Now, typically, wisdom increases with aging. Again, it doesn't happen in everybody. You know, there are some very unwise old people. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> but by and large, because with aging, we have more experiences, positive, negative. We learn something from them and we become wiser, right? But you don't have to wait to be old to be wise. That doesn't make sense. Actually, older people can teach wisdom to younger ones. And again, this book that we publish, uh, uh, Wiser, is based on that, that you don't have to wait to be old, you can actually get wisdom at a younger age. How do you get the wisdom at a younger age? You can read about wisdom, you can practice this, you can follow the role models of people you consider wise. You can talk to your grandparents and don't have to be biological grandparents, other older people you know of, you know, who are wise, learn from them. Uh, and 
there is no question that intergenerational activities, they help older people in improving their happiness and even physical health. And they help younger people improving their mental health and level of wisdom. Great. All right, so the next one is, how does the microbiome affect wisdom? <laughs> Again, this is a very first study we published that you know, the effect size is not huge, but microbiome is affected by our thinking, feeling, and behavior, and that it's a bi-directional relationship. So our thinking, feeling, behavior can affect microbiome. The microbiome can affect thinking, feeling, behavior because there is something called gut-brain axis. That thing that are happening in the gut actually can have impact on the brain because there are some connections. Uh, we know that actually, for example, that um, for some diseases, um, stool transplants actually can help some diseases. Uh, that has not happened yet quite with mental illnesses, except there is some suggestion that in depression, it might work. So, so all I'm saying is at this stage, this is an emerging science. We can't make any definitive statement. We need more research. And once we do that, but I, I do feel that there is a lot of potential there. And I'm just delighted that at UCSD, we have somebody like Rob Knight and the Center for Microbiome Innovation, which is one of the top, if not the top uh, centers of microbiome in the world. Great. Well, you have another uh, appreciation of the presentation and a question of how does the application of emotional intelligence play a role in the neurobiology of wisdom and overall its connection to loneliness? Sure. So the concept of emotional intelligence, I think the, the problem is that it has been defined differently and there are no definitive measures for emotional intelligence. But if you think about emotional intelligence as specific components, the wisdom does include emotional regulation, right? I mentioned that there is positivity. Uh, empathy and compassion also include emotions, right? So it, these are involved in wisdom. And so making ourselves aware of our emotions and improving them in the right direction if by that you mean emotional intelligence, I would say definitely we should do that because that will improve wisdom. Great. Can you comment on wisdom in family dynamics? Yes. So, so this can work in two different ways. One is that wisdom, like other personality traits, is partly genetically determined. I would say about 50% of any trait is genetically determined usually. Right. So you'll see families in which people tend to be more compassionate, empathic, emotional regulated, etc., and other families which are at the other extreme. Right. So, so there is one is that the biologically determined similarity within family members. But the other and even more important is the older members of the family serve as role models for the younger ones. The parents affect the children's behavior not what the parent teach, what not they preach, but what they practice, right? I mean, if the parents talk about compassion and they themselves are very selfish and don't help others, that's not a good role model. So family dynamics do have an important role. If the different members of the family get along well with each other, you know, they're respectful uh, and compassionate, clearly that will affect wisdom in the children. Whereas if there are lots of conflicts, continuous, there's a lack of emotional regulation, self-reflection, et cetera, that's not going to help uh, increase wisdom in the younger ones. Great, and kind of following along with that, uh, we had a question of, do you have any fun ideas on how to connect with grandparents? Uh, explaining, I haven't seen mine uh, in person due to the current times, but occasionally have video calls with them. Um, uh, and <laughs> I think I'm going to have to stop with that question because it just disappeared. So 
uh, fun ideas to do with grandparents? Yeah, yeah. I think, again, that, that's a very useful question because it is not only that you will be helped by having by talking to the grandparent, they will be delighted to talk to you because one of the problems with aging is that you lose social really you you lose family members sometimes spouse children neighbors uh, others and you feel very lonely and so when other people including the younger ones they call and establish a contact that's tremendously um, satisfying uh, for them so i would strongly suggest that we should do everything we can to help uh, you know to connect with the grandparent again we will benefit from that obviously the younger one but it also helped the older generation. And the way to connect, any way you can do that, you know, if, um, if they don't have technologies, just write a letter, you know, from there to uh, uh, FaceTime, if they have uh, iPhone, um, uh, to sharing videos uh, via email and so on. And kind of a, um, a comment uh, and ask if you agree, following up on that question, the greatest gift you can give an older person is to make them feel useful. Do you agree? Oh, 100%, 100% agree. I think that I will say that that is a problem for our society. It, the modern society focuses so much on youth and beauty and health that old age is considered a bad thing. Uh, older people are considered a burden on the society because they cost so much that that's what people say in terms of healthcare cost. And that is ageism at its worst, where we uh, denigrate people just because of their chronological age. That's so wrong. It, I mean, just like sexism, you um, treat women differently because of sex or same thing, racism uh, or uh, their sexual preferences, uh, you know, LGBTQ, et cetera. The various, that's the problem that we put people stereotypically in a group and we stereotype them, that's wrong. And there are older people in the 80s, even 90s who are functioning so well. Uh, and there are younger people who are not functioning well, right? So let's not focus too much on the chronological age, but we should focus on how they are useful. And so if we, and again, that uh, study I showed you is experience score. Older people who spend time in public schools, elementary public schools, um, and help the kid. Why don't we do that on a larger scale? We should pay these older people, right, to spend time. So then they will get some money because they need money, but they will also feel useful to the society. If they feel useful to the society, they will do the work, they will be healthier, and their healthcare costs will actually go down. And so it is such a, uh, in some ways, it is no brainer. And yet, it is so hard to take out ageism, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm optimistic. I think things, things will change. Society will realize how we need older people for younger generations. Definitely. All right. Well, you had so many comments saying thank you very much and very impressed with what all you have done. Uh, I think we're out of questions now and we are a little bit over time. So I think we'll we'll end there. Thank you so much again. We have recorded this presentation and uh, there were some questions about uh, sharing the slides because I think you've got a lot of really good material in there. So we'll be looking to do that. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who came and uh, stuck around for the extra question session. I think we'll call it a day. Thank you again, Dr. Jesty. Really appreciate your, your wisdom and your sharing it with us. Thank you, Karen. It is a pleasure being here and thank you for inviting me. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.